Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this special interaction with the US Deputy Secretary of State, Ms. Wendy Sherman. Madam Secretary, Deputy Secretary, it is an absolute pleasure to see you again. It has been a while since we last met for the US-India Strategic Dialogue. We recently held the 23rd meeting of the dialogue. In your presence was missed by colleagues on both sides. Uh, and your contributions have always been so thoughtful. I'm sure our viewers are well acquainted with you. Uh, for those of you who are not, Deputy Secretary Sherman's diplomatic career has had many highlights. From 2011 to 2015, she served as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs and led the US negotiating team on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action for which she was awarded the National Security Medal by President Barack Obama. She previously served as counselor under Secretary Madeleine Albright, as special advisor to President Clinton, among other positions. Most recently, she was director of the Center for Public Leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School before being sworn in as the first female and the 21st Deputy Secretary of State. She has had a busy few months recently, traveling as her country's second highest ranking diplomat. Today, she is with us in Mumbai after spending yesterday in New Delhi, where she landed from Tashkent. Madam Deputy Secretary, there is much to cover in the hour that we have with you. India and US relations have come a long way over the course of your service. We at the Ananta Center have been engaging with the US for over 20 years via our US-India strategic dialogue when this bilateral was still in its nascent stages. 10 years ago, this dialogue gave way to an additional dialogue, a track two on climate change with uh, the United States. And as you know, uh, John Podesta and I have been chairing uh, those uh, dialogues. And many of our colleagues from both these dialogues are now your colleagues in the administration. We have the honor of hosting your predecessor, uh, Deputy Secretary Began, for our flagship program, the India-US Forum, last October, a forum for which we are very proud to partner with the Ministry of External Affairs. Of course, much has happened in this year, and we truly appreciate this opportunity to interact with you and to discuss it all. A colleague of ours from the US in our last dialogue said that no other bilateral relationship has the potential to be as consequential for the 21st century as India and the US. And I agree with this wholeheartedly. The relationship has grown from strength to strength through shifts in geopolitical architecture, a global economic crisis, and multiple changes in government on both sides. Now we stand in the middle of a once in a generation pandemic and face a climate emergency. We are experiencing excellent momentum in collaboration, but the growth potential is immense. And in the face of the challenges, there are many, many challenges that lie before us. A quick note to our viewers regarding today's order of events. After the Deputy Secretary's formal remarks, she has kindly agreed to take a few questions. We request you to submit your questions via the Q&A box on your screens. We will weave in your questions throughout the conversation, so please keep them coming and do not wait till the end of the session. Without further ado, may I now request you, Madam Deputy Secretary, to address us. Thank you and good evening to everyone. I'm so glad that so many people could join us. Let me begin <clears throat> by extending warm Navatri uh, wishes to all of you. It is such a pleasure to be hosted by my good friends at the Ananta Center on my first trip to India since being sworn as Deputy Secretary of State. Uh, we have a very long friendship, Jamshed, uh, and very grateful for that very kind introduction. And thank you as well for serving as the moderator of today's event. I'm looking forward to a lively and in-depth conversation. I also wanna thank my dear friend, Kiran Pashrika, 
uh, the Ananta Center's executive director and CEO, as well as her team for organizing today's event. We have lots to talk about, and I've had the privilege of participating in many Ananta Center programs over the years and their work promoting dialogue and understanding between India and the United States. It's incredibly valuable to policymakers in both of our countries. The partnership between the United States and India, as Jamshed, you just said, is indispensable to the peace and security of the Indo-Pacific. Ours is a partnership that is firmly rooted in shared values and ideals. We are the world's two largest democracies, home to thriving and spirited public debates. We're also among the world's most diverse countries. And through our success, we demonstrate how embracing our diversity makes us stronger. We are each home to great innovators and entrepreneurs who are always pushing the leading edge in technology as you do all of the time. Medicine, clean energy, engineering, space, culture, and the arts. Our citizens have deep personal bonds with each other. Nearly 200,000 Indian students are enrolled in American universities. As Prime Minister Modi said in Washington, the Indian American community, some 4 million strong, is a bridge of friendship between our two countries. We believe in the power of appropriately regulated free markets and commerce uh, to increase the prosperity of our nations and our people. We create jobs in each other's countries through billions of dollars in direct investment and our bilateral trade is on track to break records this year. In fact, the United States is now India's largest trading partner. Above all, we share a vision for the future because we both understand that the way to build shared sustainable prosperity for our people and for the people around the world is to uphold and to strengthen the rules-based international order. <clears throat> to put it plainly, we each have a serious stake in the other's success. As President Biden said when he met with Prime Minister Modi at the White House two weeks ago, quote, our partnership is more than just what we do. It's about who we are, unquote. With so much that unites us, I truly believe that there is no challenge so great that the United States and India cannot overcome it by working together. Over the last two days, I've had the pleasure of meeting with my colleagues in the Indian government and military, including Foreign Secretary Shringla, National Security Advisor Doval, and External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar, I also had an informative meeting with Vice Admiral Kumar and visited the impressive facilities of the Western Naval Command. My colleague, Assistant Secretary for South and Central Asian Affairs, Don Liu, our Charge d'Affaires, Pat Lucina, our Consul General here in Mumbai, David Rance, and I also had the opportunity to meet with a cross-section of Indian civil society, biomedical researchers, LGBTQI plus activists, young climate leaders, and business executives. For my very first meeting in New Delhi, I sat down with several women micro entrepreneurs who are members of the Self-Employed Women's Association, or SEVA. Their energy, their talent, and their drive to build better lives, not only for themselves and their families, but for their entire communities was truly inspiring. In nearly all my official engagements here in India, I raised three issues that are critically important both to our bilateral relationship and quite frankly, to the world today. First, we are still facing a pandemic that has sickened millions of people in our two countries and claimed the lives of more than 700,000 Americans and at least 450,000 Indians. COVID-19 has upended lives and livelihoods in our two countries and in countries around the world. And it has laid bare some serious shortcomings in our societies from gaping holes in our social safety nets to structural flaws in global supply chains. But throughout this difficult time, India and the United States have stood together and helped each other. Last year, when the world was struggling to understand this new pathogen and medical supply chains were under enormous strain, India generously donated millions of pieces of personal protective equipment to places in the United States where cases were on the rise. And when the Delta variant was surging here in India, the United States was ready to respond in kind, both through official government assistance and through grassroots efforts that spoke volumes about the friendship between our citizens. 
Now we are entering a new phase. We welcomed Prime Minister Modi's participation in the global COVID-19 summit, which President Biden organized on the margins of the UN General Assembly in order to accelerate efforts worldwide to bring the pandemic to an end. We applaud India's announcement ahead of the summit that you will resume vaccine exports. As the world's largest vaccine producer, India is a crucial global leader in the fight against COVID-19. Together with Australia and Japan, the other members of the Quad, we have pledged to donate more than 1.2 billion vaccine doses globally, in addition to financing even more doses through COVAX. Through the Quad Vaccine Partnership, we will support expanded manufacturing at Biological E Limited right here in India to produce at least 1 billion doses of vaccine by the end of next year. To date, the United States has donated more than 40 million doses of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine across South and Central Asia, with millions more doses on the way. And we are making these donations with no strings attached, because protecting the world against this virus is simply the right thing to do. But ending the pandemic is not enough. We need to build back better to make the investments in clean energy, infrastructure, education, research, and innovation that will create good jobs and brighter futures for our people for years to come. COVID-19 has revealed a lot about our global economy, including how very vulnerable our global supply chains are to shocks. Businesses are having a harder time sourcing parts and materials. Container ships are waiting for weeks to unload their cargo. And middle-class families are paying the price. That's why the United States is working actively with India, as well as with our other allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific and beyond to build more secure supply chains for essential goods like medicine and medical supplies, semiconductors and critical minerals. Building more resilient supply chains gives us an opportunity to create both good jobs in our countries and to make our economy stronger when we face future moments of crisis, whether that's another pandemic or an extreme weather event. Which brings me to the second issue I raised in my meetings, and that is the climate crisis. We all know the science. If we have any hope of keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius as set out in the Paris Agreement, we have about a decade to make decisive progress in curbing our greenhouse gas pollution. If we fall short, the extreme weather that is already causing harm in the United States and in India, the deeper droughts, the more intense storms, the raging wildfires, the rising seas will continue to get worse. And our economies, our security, and above all, our people will suffer. That's why President Biden took steps to rejoin the Paris Agreement on his first day in office, and it's why he has set out ambitious goals for the United States as the world's largest historical emitter of greenhouse gas pollution to clean up our act, aiming to cut emissions at least in half by 2030 and to make our power sector carbon pollution free by 2035. Prime Minister Modi has also made clean energy and climate change a priority, setting a goal of having 450 gigawatts of renewables installed by 2030. Earlier this year, our two leaders created the Agenda 2030 Partnership to deepen our cooperation in addressing the climate crisis and working toward our national goals. As the second and third largest emitters of carbon pollution, it is crucial that our nations lead on climate change and that we do everything we can to urge other countries to set more ambitious goals for reducing their own emissions, especially now as we approach COP26 in Glasgow. Finally, in all my bilateral meetings over the last few days, along with many other issues, my Indian colleagues and I spent time talking about security and about the rules-based international order. The United States is a Pacific nation, which is a fact that I will admit few people in Washington may know, and people elsewhere sometimes have forgotten. We're a Pacific power, not only because of our geography, but because of our economy, our culture, our history, and our deep network of alliances and partnerships across Asia and the Pacific. We are proud to be major defense partners with India. Our military to military cooperation is strong and growing. The United States and India concluded four major defense enabling agreements in recent years, and we are looking forward to expanding cooperation in multiple areas, including through more information sharing, 
joint and multilateral exercises, and cooperation in the maritime space. We also continue to coordinate closely on the situation in Afghanistan. While the United States military mission in Afghanistan is ended, our commitment to the Afghan people and to preventing Afghanistan from ever again becoming a safe haven for terrorists has not. We are continuing to work with our allies and partners to provide humanitarian assistance to help the Afghan people and to help tens of thousands of Afghan evacuees settle into new homes in their new lives and to hold the Taliban accountable to the commitments they have made, including around human rights, the rights of women and children, and counterterrorism. From the earliest days after the fall of Kabul, my dear counterpart, Foreign Secretary Shringla, has joined regular video conferences of our partners and allies as we coordinate our response to the situation in Afghanistan. None of us have taken the Taliban at their word at any point in the last weeks, and none of us will take the Taliban at their word going forward. Their words must be followed by action to prevent reprisals, build an inclusive government, allow women to work and girls to get their educations, and much more to end any possible terrorism. And so far, they have fallen short of their commitments. The United States profoundly appreciates India's concerns about the potential for terrorism to spill over from Afghanistan into the wider region. Our two countries have a long history of working together to prevent terrorism, and we will soon come together for a counterterrorism joint working group, as well as a homeland security dialogue. And of course, we will continue to regularly coordinate with each other and with other like-minded countries as the situation in Afghanistan evolves. However, security is about more than defense and counterterrorism. For a nation to be truly secure requires confidence. Confidence that the middle class can grow and prosper. Confidence that human rights and human dignity will be respected. Confidence that the same set of transparent, consistent, agreed upon rules in trade and commerce on the internet and on the battlefield apply equally to everyone. Confidence, in other words, that we're competing on a level playing field. The rules-based international order established after the end of World War II has enabled peace and prosperity as no other system ever has or ever could. That's not to say it's perfect. It was built by people and people make mistakes, but that doesn't mean it is fatally flawed. It simply means we need to face the shortcomings honestly and do the important work of fixing and updating the system together. India's incredible rise over the last decades has been enabled by the rules-based international order. So too as the People's Republic of China's. But the two countries have taken very different paths. Today, Beijing is seeking to undermine the very system that benefited them for decades, to return instead to a system where stronger nations can bully and coerce other nations, or try to, into acting against their own interests. That's why it's so important for democracies, like India and the United States, to demonstrate how we deliver results for our people, to prove how freedom of enterprise and freedom of expression aren't merely incidental to economic prosperity, they are essential to it. To work together in as many places and as many ways as we can to strengthen and modernize the international system so no one is left behind as we confront the challenges of the 21st century. The good news is we are well on our way. When President Biden and President Modi met in Washington two weeks ago, for both their first face-to-face -face meeting since President Biden was inaugurated and for the first in-person Quad Leader Summit with Australia and Japan, the full range of our bilateral and multilateral cooperation was on display. From COVID-19 in healthcare, to climate change and clean energy, to trade and investment, to technology in outer space, it is hard to find an area where India and the United States are not working together. When Secretary Blinken visited India earlier this year, he reflected on another American leader's visit. In 2006, then Senator Joe Biden said here in India, quote, my dream is that in 2020, the two closest nations in the world will be India and the United States. If that occurs, the world will be safer, unquote. It's 2021 now. President Biden is in the White House and the friendship and partnership between the United States and India has never been stronger. I know it will continue to deepen as we work together 
to build a better future for our nations and for the world. Thank you again for joining us today. Shamshid, I'm looking forward to our discussion and to taking questions from the audience online. Thank you again. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Secretary, for those very <coughs> comprehensive remarks. Uh, we already have some questions uh, from viewers, but before we get to them, I have a few that I would like to uh, ask you. Uh, and to begin with, uh, you talked about the pandemic and the global threat that it is. And uh, in the recent uh, global COVID-19 summit on ending the pandemic hosted by President Biden, three ambitious targets were announced. One was vaccinate the world. The second was save lives now. And the third was to build back better. How do you see the role of India and the US coming together on these three points? Very important question. Um, President Biden has long said that no one is safe until everyone is safe. And uh, the United States has made a profound commitment uh, to the world to provide a billion vaccines. Uh, and we are ramping up that effort as fast as we possibly can. And uh, we deliver uh, vaccines either bilaterally or through COVAX, principally through COVAX, uh, to the poorer nations of the world and through the African Union as well. Um, every day, every day vaccines are going, virtually every day, somewhere, someplace. But when the Quad leaders met in Washington two weeks ago, they made a joint commitment uh, to get a billion doses uh, that would be produced and financed by the Quad uh, through Biological E Limited here in India. India, before you all were hit with just a terrible surge of COVID, uh, was completely relied on by the rest of the world uh, to supply the world with vaccines. You are the larger producer of vaccines. And we all understood how India had to turn its attention to its own people, as the United States had done as well. Uh, but now that you were coming around the corner, we hope there won't be another surge, and you've ramped up production, uh, we believe that that commitment will be met, that the financing will be there to do it. Um, and so the world has to work together, many other countries are also either producing vaccine, financing vaccine, helping to take excess vaccine and send it around the world uh, and do most of it through COVAX so that decisions are made on the basis of need with no strings attached to doing it, which is quite critical, no strings attached. It has to be for a humanitarian purpose and humanitarian purpose only. So that's how we hope to take care of the immediate those vaccines are crucial. And even though in the United States, Merck has announced that it may have a pill people can take to diminish the effects of COVID, it won't stop people from getting COVID. So everybody needs to get vaccinated. And for those of us like you and me who are a bit older uh, or who will face immune uh, issues, uh, they may indeed need to get a booster. Uh, decisions are being made in our country through our uh, federal, uh, our uh, Food and Drug Administration and the CDC decide what's appropriate. And then we have to help the rest of the world do that as well. But we then have to, and this was the discussion I had with your biomedical researchers and with your biomedical entrepreneurs uh, the other day in Delhi, we have to figure out what we need in our health systems that we didn't have this time. Build it, create it, use technology. We learned some good lessons about how to use technology uh, that was useful in this pandemic. We have to continue to use that. We have to create new technologies uh, that can help us. And we have to build the supply chain resilience that we need. If it can't be done in our own countries, we have to do it with like-minded countries so we know every, nobody's gonna be left not able to deal with the next crisis, whatever that may be. Uh, and then, as I said in my remarks, we have to work on building back better our economies, which is, a really tough job, though I note India has bounced back rather quickly. Thank you for those comments. Actually, one of the very interesting things about vaccines is that the world has been looking for a vaccine for malaria and I dengue. See. You know, and just in the last few yes. days, it's been announced that WHO has approved one. 
And so I think the, the scope for vaccines, you know, between India and the US and the rest of the world is just enormous. And we can do so much good together for yes. the whole world. Imagine how many children's lives, particularly children, yeah. are going to be saved because of that malaria vaccine. And now we just have to urge people not to be afraid and to get vaccinated. That's right. So coming to another question, which is on climate change. Uh, it's clearly become a priority for both our countries. Uh, I won't mention that we lost a few years in the meantime, uh, but you know, COP26 is just a month away. And I was wondering what you expect could happen in COP26. I mean, it's a, another moment just like Paris was, you know, uh, for the world to come together. And the whole issue of net zero for the world to come together on net zero by 2050 is crucial. How, how do you see the, not just the negotiations as such, but what the world should really be doing in the Glasgow summit? I think in the first instance, leadership by the United States and India is crucial to reaching that net zero. Because as I said, we're the second and third largest emitters. And we have both made profound commitments. We hope uh, to hear from India uh, publicly, a uh, new NDC uh, before Glasgow, uh, because it, it's crucial that that happen. But to be perfectly frank about it, which I know you know quite well, better than I do, um, we need the People's Republic of China to also um, really put forward a concrete proposal uh, because they're the third uh, big emitter amongst uh, the three of us. We really are responsible for much of the world's emissions. Uh, and so it's critical that every other country in the world, as soon as they possibly can before Glasgow, make their NDC public because then it makes the PRC an outlier and hopefully will encourage them to join the rest of the world. Um, pollution is a problem everywhere. Asthma is a problem everywhere, uh, particularly in capitals where there are uh, big emissions. Uh, we know that uh, in my country, we know that in your country, and that is certainly the case in the PRC as well. Um, we need every country though to come forward. And we need to also continue to work on climate finance uh, there are many countries that are going to have to mitigate because we haven't moved fast enough uh, what is coming and adapt to some changes, and they don't have the wherewithal to do it. So the developed world really does have to come together and create the financing mechanisms, which we are trying to do, uh, and have announced several potential ways forward in that regard, uh, to make sure that the developed world joins us uh, because they know they will not be left behind, that we will help each other. Um, climate knows no borders. Everybody has been hit by worse floods, worse cyclones, monsoons, um, have been hit by fires uh, and other uh, climate crises, uh, flooding. Um, so we all need to get to work. As you noted, Shamshed, we're already too late. And you may have things to say about this because as you say, you and John Podesta lead Ananta's uh, dialogue on this. Yes, Madam Secret Deputy Secretary, Actually, you know, you mentioned one of the most crucial points in this entire uh, scenario, which is finance. And uh, we can't depend that this finance will come only on a government to government basis. We must create the right conditions in all the countries for private capital to flow for, for climate finance. And I think uh, we have seen that wherever private capital has flown, they've done extremely well. I mean, the very fact that we can talk of a 450 gigawatt target for renewables is mostly through private finance. It's not really, you know, government handouts as such. So I think we need to make that debate move in a direction that facilitates climate finance to happen. And that should be at the role of both our countries. I quite agree. And um, uh, you make a, a truly important point. And I think private industry has come to understand that it is their interest to do this, or they are going to face crises for their business models. Correct. Yeah. yeah. No, that's uh, 
I mean, I absolutely share the whole sentiment today in the US and India that we have to raise our ambition. And I hope that Glasgow will be really successful as a result of that. Yes, agreed. Coming to another question, which you also uh, commented on, which was the Quad and the recent uh, summit, uh, the joint statement uh, <clears throat> that was there also makes it very clear, uh, especially uh, on Afghanistan. Uh, I think that the quote is, we stand together in support of Afghan nationals and call on the Taliban to provide safe passage to any person wishing to leave Afghanistan and to ensure that the human rights of all Afghans, including women, children, and minorities are respected. You spoke about this in your remarks. Uh, how, what do you feel? I mean, do you feel that the conditions uh, will become amenable to that to happen? I don't think we know. And it worries me tremendously. Um, when I was counselor to Madeleine Albright, um, I went with her to the Pashari refugee camp after the Taliban had taken charge the first time round. And uh, because we were women, we were able to sit with the women and the girls uh, to talk with them. And at the time, my daughter was a young teenager. And I listened to a young teenage girl talk about seeing her sister being raped and thrown out the window. And I listened to teachers and doctors who told me they could not do their profession anymore. Homemakers tell me they could not go to uh, get groceries anymore. Uh, it was one of the most chilling and heartbreaking meetings I've ever had in my life. Uh, and I thought about my own daughter and what it would mean for her life to live like that. So I share the profound concern we all have. Uh, and I think what I hope is that everyone engage with the Taliban. I have no problem, and the United States has no problem with people engaging with the Taliban and telling them what needs to happen that we live in the 21st century, uh, that things have changed over the last 20 years. It is not the Afghanistan that they once knew and that it will be very hard uh, to try to go all the way backwards. And the international community has to stand as one. Uh, and so that far they have uh, to not recognize uh, this government, uh, to say we have to see their actions, not just their words, that we have to make sure it's an inclusive government, which it is not yet, uh, that there is free and orderly, uh, safe and orderly travel by those who wish to relocate. And uh, that comes and fits and starts right now, um, that there not be a safe haven for terrorists, and we haven't seen that proven yet, uh, that uh, human rights are respected, including those of women, girls, and minorities as well, that there not be reprisals and revenge. So there are a whole host of things that say, you are a responsible nation living in that rules-based order that we discussed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, I think if the world stands together on this, uh, we have a chance, but I don't know the answer yet. I wish I did. Yes, I think that is of great concern to us, especially since Afghanistan is so close to us. Absolutely. We don't share a border with them, but nevertheless, you know, it has been Traditionally, between India and Afghanistan, we've had wonderful relationships. Uh, and India has done a lot in these last 20 years. Tons of projects. For the development of Afghanistan. Yes. And so I do hope that uh, we see some good progress there. Right. And I should add, the United States is providing humanitarian assistance to the Afghan people. In all of this, we cannot forget the needs of the Afghan people. We want to make sure there is food, uh, that there is medicine. Uh, and so we issued a general license so that countries around the world could provide food and medicine, true humanitarian assistance, no money to the government, operating through UN agencies or through NGOs, um, but to make sure that we understand that the Afghan people are suffering. That's a very important point. I agree with you. Yeah. We, we should not let the people suffer. Yes. Coming to trade, you know, this <clears throat> is one area where we've had quite a bit of friction between India and the US. And uh, our Commerce Minister uh, a few days ago mentioned a target of 1 trillion US dollars uh, for bilateral trade over the next decade. Do you see, uh, where do you see them, not just where the growth will come, but how, how do you see our trade relations developing? Well, 
We have a, a trade policy forum that is a great vehicle for us discussing how we can increase uh, that trade and investment. Um, the growth has been extraordinary over the last 10 years. Uh, US is now India's largest trading partner. Uh, so we have more work to do uh, to get there. Uh, but I, you know, the meetings I had with business leaders uh, here today was really exciting. Um, American business is fully anchored in India. <clears throat> they as much see themselves as local businesses as they see themselves as American businesses. That's how close a relationship we have built. Uh, so I think that we both have to be committed uh, to taking down any barriers that exist uh, here in India, uh, looking at the regulatory framework. I've heard a lot about procurement, as I'm sure you have over the years, um, making sure true in both of our countries that we uh, have the courses that provide the skills to provide the workers that we need. One of the things that happened post COVID is uh, our entire workforces haven't come back and some of the workforce doesn't match the skills needed. So skilling people so that they can create those new jobs and take those new jobs is part of what we need to do. And President Biden, as you know, uh, has a very large, uh, both infrastructure and um, reconcili reconciliation package going forward. Uh, knowing the president and everybody who's working with him in uh, the Congress, as painful as our sausage making looks to people as they watch our Congress try to wrestle their way through this, struggle their way through this, I believe we will get a result. And I believe it will be a good result uh, that we will build our infrastructure, particularly around quantum computing, artificial intelligence, uh, digital uh, technology, um, all the high value jobs we need in the future, while at the same time making sure our bridges, our roads, our trains, our airports are all up to the job. And that's important for India as well, to make sure that they have that infrastructure and that the unbelievable technologists you have here in this country uh, bring everything they have to bear and create the new economy. Actually, one of the very interesting new developments in India over the last five, 10 years has been the startup culture that has happened in India. And many of the, you know, the areas that you mentioned are part of that startup culture. And it's something that's so exciting. Utterly. And to cooperate with India and the US mm -hmm. on startups is, I think, something that's just amazing. A lot of US companies who finance startups are here doing that. And I think it's a great uh, cooperation. I totally agree with you. It is the most exciting to see all these young people just think of ideas that never occurred mm -hmm. to me. So, Madam Sec Deputy Secretary, uh, I have a few questions uh, from uh, some of the people who've been participating in these dialogues <coughs> over the years. Uh, the next question is from uh, India's former High Commissioner to Pakistan. His name is Gautam Bambabwe. And he asks, what can you tell us about AUKUS, A-U-K-U-S, you know, the Australian? Yes, I do. <laughs> and B, how do you see it in relation to the Quad? Sure. There are many elements that we need to ensure a free, open, inclusive, interconnected Indo-Pacific. The Quad is one vehicle uh, which largely operates in security realms that are non-military, non-defense, uh, things that we do together on vaccines and infrastructure and supply chains and technology, uh, really climate, all the forward thinking areas in which we have to gain confidence and ensure the security for our people. Um, AUKUS is a new element of an understanding between the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, and excuse Australia. me, Australia, uh, to spend the next 18 months uh, considering uh, helping Australia to build a fleet of nuclear propelled submarines. They are faster. They are harder to detect. They are more agile uh, and very useful in the environment in the Indo-Pacific. Um, it is a one of a kind project um, which will be a game changer in a maritime sense uh, in this broad arena. Uh, we also have 
our treaty allies in the Asia Pacific. Uh, we have uh, our partners uh, like India. I spent this afternoon with Western Naval Command uh, with Vice Admiral Kumar. Fabulous presentation of what uh, the Western Naval Command is doing, um, the ways in which we could further partner. That relationship is critical. Um, we have lots of other elements, our enabling uh, agreements with India. So these pieces do not compete. They are all pieces of a puzzle to ensure that we have an open, free, interconnected and inclusive Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question is from our common friend, Mr. Tarun Das. <laughs> sure. He's saying uh, a unique initiative was recently introduced at the Quad Summit, supported by a number <coughs> of private entities in the US for building people to people contact by providing 100 fellowships to graduate level STEM students. Madam Deputy Secretary, Ananda Aspen Center wishes to take a new initiative for American economic students to come to India for short term fellowships. Do you think this is an idea worth pursuing? I think every people to people idea is an idea worth pursuing. We have such tremendous strength in our people to people connections uh, not only the um, millions of uh, Indian Americans, including our vice president, who has Indian heritage, um, but uh, everything that we do and Americans who are here. Um, as you noted, I was a professor of the practice of public leadership and director of the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard Kennedy School before I came back to government. And uh, I had a lot of students uh, from India and a lot of Indian American students. And they are so excited to create that partnership, uh, to have those people to people exchanges. We learn from each other. Um, half of the student body at the Kennedy School is foreign. And it creates a conversation that makes it real world, not just viewing the world through American eyes, but viewing the world through Indian eyes. And everybody else's eyes for that matter, from all over the world. And I just think it is terribly critical. So I'm very excited about what the Quad has announced and Tarun, your idea of a short-term fellowships around economics, an area where we all have to move faster and in a more agile way is a great idea. Thank you. So you know also uh, our uh, former ambassador, Mr. Namba, who is a uh, former special envoy to the Prime Minister of India and a former chairman of the Ananta Aspen Center. And his question is, we now have a number of high level working groups and dialogues on counter-terrorism. It featured as a key point of conversation between our president and <coughs> prime minister's meeting and in the Quad Summit. What are the goals from a bilateral partnership on counter-terrorism? I think it's everything from what are all the things we need to think of to what are the nitty gritty operational things we need to do together. Um, you know, that is part of uh, listening to the Vice Admiral this afternoon in terms of the maritime uh, arena and what uh, the Western Naval Command is doing and what they are doing with uh, the United States Navy. Um, it is down to that operational level, uh, but it's also us understanding the geostrategic map around terrorism, uh, where it's likely to come from, uh, how we make sure in our over the horizon efforts, uh, given that we no longer have a military presence in Afghanistan, uh, we are always mindful of India's security in what we do, um, in sharing intelligence and information with each other, uh, so that we uh, make sure that we uh, don't ever create a safe haven for terrorists. It is a really profound and difficult job um, we have a lot of experience with each other uh, and working together, we have been quite able uh, and I suspect we will be into the future as well. Thank you. So the next question is from uh, Mr. Ravi Singh. He's the Secretary General and CEO of the Worldwide Fund for Nature in India. His question is, President Biden and Special Envoy Kerry have acknowledged the importance of mobilizing finance for investments 
that will guarantee clean, reliable power for millions of Indian households. The private sector has a big role to play here. What do you think can be done to encourage private sector flows? So it's it's a takeoff from what we just discussed. Yeah, I mean, I think we're doing that, as you said. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the special presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry, has been here twice. I tease, but only half tease. You, you quite likely might see him again uh, before COP26. He is um, really just committed to this and committed to finance. Uh, and in fact, I think, let me see what the name of it is, because it's hard to keep track of this. Uh, he launched a new uh, climate action and finance mobilization dialogue with India uh, to see what we can do further together. So I think it's quite along these lines. Now, I have to say, uh, Shamshed, it would not be me if I didn't say that so far all the questions have come from men, if I understand names correctly. Mm -hmm. So go find me a question from a woman. <laughs> we will try. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I think that the, the two questions I have from the from the audience also are from men. Go for it. And let me just say <laughs> to the women out there next time, raise your hand and send in a question. That's right. So this is from uh, Chintan Modi, who has submitted this question, introducing himself as a queer journalist from Mumbai. Could the deputy secretary talk about US-India collaboration in LGBTQI issues? You mentioned that you met many LGBTQI leaders in India. Could you please share your impressions from these meetings? I had the real privilege of meeting with a group of LGBTQI plus uh, activists this morning. And uh, I was just really profoundly moved uh, by not only who they were, but what they have done and what they are doing. Um, and. I've come to India for many years, as you noted, we've known each other a long time. The change is really quite amazing in a very good way uh, that I can't imagine a decade ago I would have come here and anyone would have showed up for such a meeting. Uh, and in my own country, it's been a long time coming to where we are and we still have uh, violence and we still have struggles. Um, but I was really heartened uh, by the courage, the activism, the clarity of the folks with whom I met today. I've raised these issues with the government here. Uh, I raise them everywhere. Uh, we are committed to this. I had the privilege of raising the pride flag at the US State Department for the first time this year. And I know that our embassy raised the flag and at every consulate we raise the flag because it's important to say that everybody should be able to live with dignity and to love who they love. And I know that there are cultural and traditional and religious barriers for a lot of people. And I respect that people may have different views, but I know that, because I've seen it so many times, that if this is who someone is in your family, for the most part, people love their children, their aunts, their uncles, their parents unconditionally. And that is what I hope for in society that whether you're LGBTQI plus or you are physically challenged or you have some other kind of disability, that we all respect people uh, for the dignity of who they are. Thank you. Well, I think you're prodding a woman to ask the question has resulted <laughs> in the question. Great. <laughs> <laughs> it's from Aruna Goel. Uh, She's saying cyber crimes targeted towards women seem to be rising. It's a cultural, technological, and security concern. How can our countries collaborate to solve this problem? Yes, I think cyber crimes against women, uh, just like uh, all violence against women and sexual violence against women, uh, is really a, a cultural phenomenon we all have to deal with, uh, to not be threatened by change that is taking place. Uh, for women to gather together, along with what I call the Galahad men, uh, to make the changes that we need to make sure that people are protected and don't have to be worried for their security. We have huge issues on cyber uh, and huge issues in technology uh, about how we use it, how people can be surveilled and how people can be identified uh, and in fact uh, harassed online. Uh, and um, we're all gonna to have to work to find the technological fixes uh, to that. 
But more than anything, whether it is cybercrime against women or sexual violence against women or domestic violence, uh, we all have to work together uh, to say this is simply not acceptable, simply not acceptable. That's a very strong statement, and I'm glad you're able to make that today. Thank you. There's a question from a gentleman by the name of Vishal Sangvi, and he's saying, can you talk about the possible collaboration between the small, medium uh, enterprises in both countries? This is a really good question because the American economy has always been driven by small and medium businesses. Uh, and it is the creation of particularly small business. We have a small business administration because it is, it is the engine of our economy. Small business is the engine of the American economy. And we all know about the big companies um, because they are the brands, uh, but many of them started as somebody's idea somebody's small company that grew. Uh, as you say, the young entrepreneurs that you've met that are just beginning uh, these startups and seeing where they will go. Um, so I think that we all need to do whatever we can to incentivize those startup entrepreneurs, um, whatever we can do to help small business in our country, particularly women-owned and minority-owned businesses, uh, so that we create a more level playing field for access and for opportunity in our country. I'm sure you are doing the same and thinking about the same kinds of things here. Uh, so that everybody, no matter where they come from, no matter what their station has been in life, uh, that they are able to have access to opportunity and a chance to be that successful small or medium sized business. Uh, because that really is what fuels the middle class. No question. Oh, you're absolutely right. And I think uh, there are some mechanisms for interchange between uh, ideas and investments, et cetera, but it is a very difficult sector for that collaboration to take mm -hmm. place. And whatever our governments can do to facilitate that. Uh, for instance, I know that you have a small business administration yeah. in the US, which specifically does that. We have one similar to in India also, but how to bring this collaboration between the two could be a challenging issue. I think one of the things, and I was listening to my colleagues here at the consulate, is uh, in the United States, state governments and city governments all do international trade, all, all do. Uh, and uh, here in India, uh, your state governments, in fact, have their own economic plans and investment plans and trade plans. And some of the best work we've done is when our state leaders or our city leaders come and are fueling those medium-sized businesses. Maybe not the big ones, but a business in their state that is looking out to export or needs imports for a product they're trying to create. So I think that's an avenue of exchange that is quite crucial. And I'm glad it's going on here at our consulate because uh, I think it's a, a driver of exactly what this questioner is asking. No, as exactly as you said, the large companies have their own ways of getting around. And we really must uh, facilitate the medium size and the smaller companies to work together. And that's a really important thing. I'm glad the consulate, of course, is doing a lot on that. So a number of people uh, have asked this question. <laughs> They're saying you are traveling to Islamabad from here. Could you please talk a little about what you hope to touch upon on this? <clears throat> So thank you for the question. Um, yes, I'm going to uh, Islamabad tonight and I will be there for the day tomorrow. And it's for a very specific and narrow purpose. Uh, we don't see ourselves building a broad relationship with Pakistan and we have no interest in returning to the days of a hyphenated India-Pakistan. Uh, that's not where we are. That's not where we're going to be. But we all need to know what's going on in Afghanistan. We all need to be of one mind in the approach to the Taliban. Uh, we all need to make sure that we have the capabilities that we need to ensure everybody's security, including India's, of course. And so um, I'm going to have some very specific conversations, uh, continuing conversations that Secretary Blinken has had 
uh, and uh, in his, uh, he met with Foreign Minister Kreshi at the UN General Assembly. And by the way, I wanna congratulate and herald the tremendous job that India uh, did as president of the UN Security Council, really a first rate job, uh, great leadership. Uh, so it's a very uh, particular uh, set of reasons for going uh, and um, be glad as always, uh, we share information back and forth between our governments and I will be glad to brief on the trip. Thank you. I think that will help to clarify. So there's another uh, question that a uh, number of uh, uh, viewers have uh, spoken about and they're saying that you were in Europe on the first part of this trip. Uh, what have been your impressions about the European Union's views on the Indo-Pacific and uh, do you think their engagement with the region is likely to increase? I am sure their engagement with the region is going to increase. Now there are some members of the European Union have long histories like the French in the Indo-Pacific uh, and um, uh, so there's no doubt and the European Union has already put out an Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, and uh, we're going to, in fact, have some formal consultations between the United States, uh, which I'll lead with my counterpart, Stefano Cimino. Uh, I hope uh, we'll get that underway, um, waiting uh, for uh, our government to decide how we're going to proceed here. Um, but uh, I think that not only will the European Union get more engaged, uh, but India should get more engaged with the European Union. Uh, they are a critical player. Uh, they have a role here. Uh, they care a great deal. You do trade and investment with Europe as well. Um, and so we do security work together. Um, so yes, I, I hope it goes both ways. The European Union here and you with the European Union. I think it would help be helpful for all of us. Yes. Well, that's, that's very constructive. I think that's very useful. So, Bob. Madam Deputy Secretary, I think we are coming to the last couple of minutes uh, of our conversation this evening. I wonder if you have any final uh, thoughts or comments you'd like to talk about. No, I had to make myself these cheat sheets of everything we are doing because it is so vast. It covers so many arenas, but it all wraps up to speak to the depth and the breadth of the India-US relationship. I've never seen it, not only this robust and this energetic, but this meaningful in terms of creating the future that will make a difference for the people in our country. Because if, at the end of the day, that's what we're all trying to do is ensure that people have good lives. Uh, and I can't think of a better partner with whom to do it with than India. Thank you very much. Madam Deputy Secretary, really do appreciate uh, not only your visit to India, but uh, your spending this hour with us uh, and answering uh, such uh, in-depth uh, questions. Uh, and we look forward to just greater and greater cooperation in all the areas we've talked about. And uh, look forward to, of course, meeting with you whenever we bring a delegation from the Ananta Center to the US. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. Thank you.